Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I'm very excited to have my dear friend, Dr. Marty Greer, here this evening, and she tells me we might get in trouble. So I, I'm going to go with good trouble. We're going to have some good trouble tonight, Marty and I, and we're going to talk about um, some taboos in purebred dogs. There's some things that, you know, a lot of people don't want to talk about, or they're scared to talk about, or they're hard to talk about, or they're questioning existing um, protocols and all kinds of stuff. And so Marty and I are here. We got you. We are going to break down some of these taboos. So Marty, are we starting with debarks? I think that's a good place to begin. Okay. Let's start with debarks. Talk to us about this procedure, or okay. as I have frequently heard it referred to, bark softening. Okay. That's great. Um, sometimes if we yes. put easier language around things, it's easier to talk about. So let's talk about bark softening. And let's talk about what that procedure entails, yeah. why we do it, and why, it, why it's done. Sure. So some people call it urban bark. Some people call it bark softening. You're right. It kind of gentrifies the term a little bit because you're really not taking away the bark. No. You really are softening it. And there's a lot of misconceptions about it. I've heard all kinds of stories about how cruel it is and how difficult the procedure is for the patient. And, and honestly, none of them are true. I've been debarking dogs for probably 15 years, I was taught by another veterinarian how to do it. Now, there's two approaches. There's the one where you put the dog under anesthesia, make an incision under the uh, underside of the neck, and go in and remove the vocal folds. But more commonly, it's done through the oral cavity. We basically give the dog full anesthesia, depending on the anesthetic agent that your veterinarian wants to use. I use um, ketamine and Valium because it keeps the Larynx from moving propofol and alfaxin to let, still let it move. So you're trying to work on a moving target. That doesn't work as well. So I use ketamine and Valium. It's full anesthesia. The dog is completely anesthetized, not awake at all. And basically you go in and I grab a hold of the vocal fold on one side and snip the top, snip the bottom, and then meet those two incisions with a pair of scissors. That takes about 10 seconds. I then fold, uh, let go of that fold and then approach the opposite side, right or left, and do the exact same thing. Cut the top, cut the bottom, meet in the middle. You want to try to avoid the most underneath part of the larynx because that'll give you some scar tissue. And um, as soon as you do that, we recover the patient. There's a little bit of bleeding. Um, some dogs bleed a little, some dogs bleed a little bit more. So we watch them very carefully so that their airway is protected. They don't recover on their own. It, you know, They're always with someone. And they stand up and they walk out the door and they act like nothing ever happened other than maybe a little bit of a sore throat. I've heard some people use a, a mirror biopsy forceps, a uterine biopsy forceps, so they take a little triangle of the tissue out. So it's just a different approach. We do not jam a pipe down their throat. We do not do anything harsh to the dog. They wake up, they go home, they, they eat that day. I have them feed softened food for a couple of days. And I try to minimize barking for a few days post-op with something like gabapentin, trazodone, tramadol, something to keep them quiet. And they go merrily on their way. Um, I was actually talking about this with one of my employees today because we did bark soften her dog. And her mother was under the impression that it was a cruel thing to do. Mm -hmm. And she said, Mom... The dog is a whole different dog now. He's a little tiny Shih Tzu, but he would bark incessantly. And she was always yelling at him. And if she'd put a bark collar on him, then he would be fearful. The collar freaked him out. And then anytime she'd put any kind of a collar on him, he would freak out. She had neighbors complaining. I mean, it's, it's, it's just such an easy procedure for the dog. And yes, there are some breeds that are more likely to have this done than others because of their uh, behavior that mm -hmm. they think barking is a recreational activity and they they just do it for no particular reason other than it's a good time to do and the dogs are psychologically they like to hear themselves stuck i think yeah and we know people like that but they don't they, they don't <laughs> some of them host podcasts so I'm just... <laughs> some of our guests but anyway <laughs> they just they bark because it's fun and these dogs now can stay in their homes the neighbors aren't calling the police. 
The neighbors aren't reporting you for anything awful. Mm -hmm. The dogs merrily go on their way barking. They still have the same amount of fun barking. You didn't make them stop barking like a collar does, like a shock collar or a citronella collar. They still have a great time barking. They still bark in unison with everybody else in the house. It's just you're not waking the dead. It's much cooler than yelling at your dog or getting thrown out of your house or having the police knock on your door all the time. It's a really nice thing for people that live in close proximity to other people. Now, not everybody with dogs can live, you know, on a 40 acre parcel of land with no neighbors. It doesn't work that way, folks. Right. Used to. I, I'm going to tell you, I live on acreage. I have two and a half acres. And I've had my neighbors get up in my junk because my dogs, you know, I tell me stories sometimes. And yeah. I, talk to me a little bit because this is where, and again, I have probably some misconceptions. So I, I can come to it from like the John Q. public position because I don't know enough about this procedure. I have working dogs. Like they go hunting, right? Like they run, they go hunting. Talk to me about potential downsides for dogs who are actually really, really active in physical jobs that require to them to run for an hour to five hours at a time. Yeah. And that's a good question. On some occasions, certain dogs will form scar tissue. Depends on how the procedure is done and it depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. The more... Um, damage you do to the ventral part of the, the fornix of the larynx, the more likely they are to form scar tissue. And if you try to break down that scar tissue, then it just reforms. So that makes it pretty difficult. So if you do have a high performance dog that has scar tissue, it's going to impair their breathing, their airway, if they're outperforming at a pretty high level for an extended period of time or in hot weather. So yes, you do need need to be careful with that. Hi, Dana. But your average farm dog, sorry. I, you guys can't see the video, but I see Marty's little companion come to snuggle with her. This is little Emmy Lou. So the average um, Schulte is not a high performance dog. It might run some agility for a 45 second course, but it's not gonna go out hunting for five hours. You're right. So if you do have dogs that are hunting dogs, you probably wanna be really careful with um, which dogs are done and how the procedure is done and who the veterinarian is that's doing it and mm -hmm. monitoring them post-op to reduce scar tissue. But um, in general, these dogs recover uneventfully. And in, you know, two or three days, they're, they're just running around like nothing ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I would be cautious if I had a, if I had a field trial Labrador, I'd be careful, mm -hmm. but it's not as bad as laryngeal paralysis and heaven knows we see enough of that in Labradors. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay, so that's taboo number one, debark. Taboo number two, I think the next one we're going to do is the now au courant <clears throat> topic of dew claws and whether <laughs> they should, I know, right? Um, this has been something that has never even been discussed in my eh, 40 years in dogs and actively and consciously being aware of what's going on in dog breeding. And this is in the last like couple, three years, all of a sudden everybody believes that leaving the dew claws on their dogs is the right answer. Mm -hmm. So there have been studies and people that have opinions, lots of opinions, and I would be very interested to hear yours. Sure. So today I took some video of doing a tail dock and a dew claw removal on a puppy so that we could share that with the people who are um, tuning in. Obviously, they can't see it on a podcast, but I took that and I do have some video of the bark softening as well. So we, we can put up a couple videos so we uh, can people can actually see them. We can put future. those in the show notes for people who want to see them. Right. So I don't want people to be deprived of it. So um, there are definitely people who feel strongly. I believe Christine Zink is one of them and I have a Christine healthy respect for, yep. for her, but I don't see problems with the dew claws coming off. I know there are people who feel that it weakens the carpal joint in the dog. And I, to this day, have not seen a dog break down its carpus um, and have difficulty with its carpal joint related to a dew claw removal. Um, we do see dew claws that get torn off during hunting, during other kind of activities. 
Um, and so I, I feel like the people personally are- have had dogs that that happened to. This is why I'm a little, you know, like I like science. I like knowledge, but I also like what works. <laughs> right. And I have not seen dogs break this down. And I actually haven't seen any literature that suggests that they've got proof that that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. I've seen one Samoyed break down its carpal joints. Um, it was walking really, really flat footed. And of course, Sammy's walk a little flat anyway. They're supposed to. Um, they're not supposed to have a cat foot like a Dalmatian. They, they're mm-hmm. supposed to be structurally different than that. Um, so I've heard two people, two, two different reasons that people have described. One is they feel that the carpal joint breaks down and I don't see that happening. Um, I see structural issues. I see Pembroke Welsh Corgis that have fronts like cardigans and that's wrong. And so they don't break down because of their dew claws. They break down because they aren't made right to begin with. I've also heard people say that the dew claw will allow the dog, if they fall through an icy pond, allow the dog to get a hold of the um, ice and pull itself out, out and save its life. If your dog is in icy water and the only thing that saves it is a dew claw, okay, I would love to see that video because I don't know. Hypotheticals don't. are great. I don't see um, it happening. And, and I guess, you know, everybody should do them, right? Like you do you. You know what I'm saying? If you feel strongly about leaving dew claws, leave dew claws. I think that's fine. Um, right. I I think it's really important in today's society to give people the space to mm-hmm. to do with their dogs what they believe is right. Yes. But I think that works both ways, yes. right? Um, you may believe strongly that dew claws are important for your dog. Well, then you should absolutely leave dew claws on your puppies. If I don't believe as strongly and believe just as strongly that removing dew claws makes my working field dog safer as adults, I would think that there should be space for that opinion. And I would intentionally came to you seeking guidance as to whether I'm off base on that. Yeah. And I agree with you. I think people have the opportunity to say that. Now I have Danish Swedish farm dogs. They don't take the dew claws off in Denmark and Sweden, but that's what they tell me. I'm telling you that I know I see rear dew claws that have been removed on some of these dogs. I've seen scars on some of them. I've seen the, the bitches produce puppies with them that have had these scars. So I know that they're taking off the rear dew claws, even though it's not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, So it does happen. And I remember my first uh, breeder client, when I started veterinary practice 42 years ago, he showed Dalmatians and he said to me, I'll look like a bumpkin if I go in the ring with dew claws on my dog. So I think there's a lot of breed variation. Right. Um, But I will tell you that the people who say, I think dew claws should stay on because they cause the carpal joint to break down if you take them off, are the people who are sitting on the couch on Sunday afternoon drinking a glass of wine and watching a golf tournament while I'm at the clinic sewing the dogs back together. That I had also- out hunting in um, the the rat brush and cattails and down exactly. logs. Exactly. I can tell you every opening day that we have in Wisconsin, and I've been here for 42 of them, we're sewing somebody up because they've hit a barbed wire fence or ripped off a dew claw or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So there's no question that there there's damage. Um, It's up to you, you know, do it what you want. A lot of people are taking tails off and leaving dew claws now. You know, there's a lot of variation in how people want to do things. But if you leave them on and ask for your veterinarian to take them off as an, a young adult or an adult dog, it is very expensive and is very hard on the dog. And they pull the staples or the sutures out because their little lips are right above their dew claw when they're resting. So they are a harder surgery to recover from as an adult than a spay or neuter. Yeah. It's much more difficult. We are at the Kentuckiana cluster of dog shows and I'm talking to Dr. Karen Potter. She is a German wire hair pointer breeder, a Trupanion breeder, and she's also a veterinarian. And Karen's gonna talk about what Trupanion means to her as a breeder, and also what it means for her as a veterinarian. When I became a Trupanion breeder, and I had sent my litters out, I knew that they were going with 30 days of coverage had one of my owners have an emergency with them. That's comforting to me as a breeder to know that they can get help. 
as a veterinarian, there are many cases where we have to make decisions on how to treat things based on financial restraints. And when the financial restraints come into play, we can't always do absolutely everything for that pet. So if my puppies are covered, at least for those first 30 days, I know that if they get sick, they can get the best possible care. I know I have covered some of these other taboo topics and other instances with people on the podcast. And, you know, we talk about you're, you're the president of the NAIA. You, you know, you do a lot of work with animal rights and we see some of these things that are happening in other countries. So we've talked about ear crops and we've talked about tail dogs, but we haven't talked to a veterinarian about it. So I'm pitching it into your court in our in our additional taboo topics in terms of everybody gets to have the space to do what they want to do. But let's talk about this in a very real way. Mm -hmm. Tail dog. Yeah. Tail docking. Again, <clears throat> that's a breed variation. I've had Pembroke Lost Corgis for 35 years. Mm -hmm. There's a couple ways to do tails. One is to ban them and let them slowly become necrotic and fall off, sometimes get infected. It's icky and gross, and I don't like to do it. Number two is people will grab it with a caramel and twist the tail and snap it and break it off and then cut it. That makes me totally insane. And the third way is to do a really humane way, and that's... That and have you do it. <laughs> I, exactly. I've been, literally, I've been breeding dock-tailed breeds since um, like 1980 something, mm -hmm. and I can quite, quite easily and comfortably assert that I have never considered, you know, whacking them off with an axe on the stump like some of the old wire people used to do. I oh, go yeah. to a veterinarian when they're three days old. They do it. We're done. Yeah, so we typically wait until the puppies are gaining weight. So sometimes it's a little older than three days. If we have um, a, a litter or puppies in a litter that aren't thriving, we wait until they're a little bit older. I put in a local block of lidocaine with bicarb, and they squawk just a little bit as you do the injection. And then we put them in the basket, let, them, let the lidocaine and bicarb kick in. And then we take the tail off. And they don't cry. And we suture them up. We do sterile packs, sterile gloves, local block. We yep. give them Cairo syrup before we dock it because there were studies done in baby pigs that showed that baby pigs had lower cortisol levels when they were castrated if you gave them glucose. So we use Cairo syrup or Eagle brand sweetened condensed milk. We give it orally before we do it. That and then we put the one and I'm making a note of that. I like that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so take a bottle. If your vet doesn't do it, take a mm -hmm. bottle along. Have your technician give it as they're prepping the puppies. Mm -hmm. We put them back in the basket, and as soon as you lay them down, they start nursing again, and they're quiet, and they're happy, mm -hmm. and they do great. So it's a lot about breed type. If we don't do tails on Pembroke Lost Corgis, they look like cardigans to a lot of people. That's the only difference that they can see. There are two different breeds. You can certainly see a difference, but not everybody sees it. Um, I was talking to Mark Dunn. A couple of weeks ago, and he'd been over to Crufts this AKC year. Vice and, President of everything, Mark. Yeah, I can see Mark. Um, and he said that he, he was showing me pictures of these Dobermans that had double looped tails, not just down ears, but their tails didn't do just, their tails didn't stick out straight. Their tails did two curls around mm -hmm. like, ah, like, mm -hmm. so you completely lose breed type. Mm -hmm. And we have bred a lot of our breeds for so long, not paying attention to tail set and tail carriage that when you decide tail to stop carriage, taking them, mostly. Yeah. It's horrible. They don't look anything like the breed they're supposed to. Well, and I'm going to jump in here because this is our conversational podcast. I'm going to jump in here with my own personal knowledge of hunting dogs and the fact that tail docking was banned in Scotland until they did a study on working dogs and they lifted that ban for working dogs because there were so many tail injuries. Yeah. And so we talk about the different breeds and I'll just use the sporting group because I'm very comfortable with the knowledge in this group. The setters and the pointers were dogs that were bred to hunt in open fields, not in heavy cover the continental versatile hunting dogs, right? Short hairs, wire hairs, Vichelas, Weimaraners, Britneys, Spinoni, Brackos. These were breeds that were designed to hunt 
in very heavy cover, as were most of the spaniel breeds. Mm -hmm. And they're breeds that don't have a tail like a Labrador. And they get whipping that tail around. And I will tell you, there is nothing. I I know you've seen it. I've seen it. Nothing, nothing more horrible than a broken bleeding tail. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Dalmatians, um, Great Danes, those long whip tails, they they crack them on everything. Great, they call it great tail. Off. Yeah. Great tail. They crack them on your leg. They crack them on the wall, in the crate, in the kennel. And then they start to bleed and then, oh my God, it looks like an ax murder happened in your house. It is unbelievable how much blood they can spray around from the end of their tail. And they're very hard to bandage. They don't heal very well. So they can be a real challenge. But if you look at the difference between a setter tail and a Labrador tail, a Labrador tail is supposed to have an outer tail. It's supposed to help them in the water. That thing is a whip. That thing is a wicked, really nasty like weapon. Club. Yeah, it's a club. As it hits your leg for the 152nd time right. in the exam, you're like, ah! Um, but you look at the setters and some of these other dogs with a more graceful um, mm -hmm. feathered tail. They wag them differently. They carry them differently. They use them differently. They don't use them like a rudder. It's a whole different thing. So, yes, we have bred these dogs for these different things. And then we forgot when we started to say, well, we're not going to take them off anymore. We forgot that we didn't start off with the same kind of tail. So no, you would not do a tail dock on a Labrador unless it had a tumor or an injury that you couldn't get to heal, but you sure as heck would on some of these other breeds. Yeah. So yes, there, there's a lot of reasons that people do tails. It's not just about breed type. It is really about function as well. Yep. So then we will close out this evening with the one that I am going to freely admit. I will freely admit. I, I struggle with good, um, discussion, good talking points about ear crops because I don't come from crop breeds. I do. I can do great on tail docks because I know why we have tail docks. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about ear crops, what a proper ear crop does and how it's done and why in the breeds that they're used in, they're there. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is when dogs were used to fight for fighting and it was okay to do that socially. Mm -hmm. um, it cut down on the number of injuries that dogs had. They, they weren't as able to grab the other dog's ear and cause damage to it. Um, so I think that was one of the original reasons that people did ears. Number two is a dog with an upright ear always has a more frightening appearance to a human and to another dog. So German Shepherds with an upright ear um, are scarier looking than a Springer Spaniel. So if you look at some of the dogs that are used by police and other law enforcement agencies, for instance, in England, we were over there 15 or 20 years ago, they were using Springer Spaniels because they have a down, a drop ear and they, they have a softer appearance than that dog with the upright ear. So the Doberman, the, the German Shepherd, you know, anything with a, with a no. cropped ear, upright ear, does look more scary to people. Um, there's a reason that the service dog organizations use golden retrievers labs and lab golden crosses because they're a softer, gentler looking dog. So I think it's partly about appearance. And now we've got breed type. Mm -hmm. So breed type is a big deal in some breeds. If you don't crop the ears on a Doberman, it doesn't look like a Doberman. If you don't crop them on a Dane, if you don't crop them on a Boxer, you can still identify the breed. Get you it. don't crop them on a Doberman, they look like a black and tan coon hound and they a do really bad lab. Oh yeah. Depending on the color. I yeah. just did, you know, a couple of ear crops last week and the puppies had these big hound dog ears. They were Dobermans. I'm like, yeah, boy, you're not, you're not very Doberman -y looking with that, with this ear. So, you know, those are all the reasons I think people do it. People do also try to justify it saying that they have fewer ear infections. And I think that's probably true. Other than the German Shepherd, most dogs with upright ears have very few ear infections. Mm -hmm. Very few. Samoyeds, corgis. We just hardly see an ear infection in those breeds. Well, and, you know, I've seen some, and, and I would love to hear your input on this. I have seen some studies and discussions and sort of conversation around the fact that wild dog populations all have upright ears and it was domestication 
that made the dog's ears fall down. And is it the Russian fox study? Am I getting that right? That, uh, that was talk- on, I don't think that's the right study. But when, the, typical, the ears started to go down as they domesticated the dogs. It, it was right. a fascinating study. Right. So they have a softer appearance, but mm. you're right. The, the quintessential street dog, no matter what part of the globe you're in, is a 30 pound brown, short coated dog with a long tail and an upright ear and a you know brown eye. So yes, all the things that we've done to dogs to domesticate them have included those things. And part of it probably is that the drop ear is a softer looking ear. Mm -hmm. But we also see, you know, a lot of ear infections in Springer Spaniels, Cocker Spaniels, any heavy ear dogs. (laughs) Yeah. Any heavier dog with a lot of hair in its ear is going to have a lot of ear infections, just terrible chronic problems. Mm -hmm. So there, there's definitely some discussion about that, but I don't think you can say I'm going to do an ear crop to prevent ear infections. I think that's a stretch. Right. Right. So talk to us a little bit, just gently through the procedure that we do for an ear crop. I understand. And I think the listeners all understand that it varies by breed. Each breed mm-hmm. has its own specific ear crop from a Doberman to a standard Schnauzer, you know, to an AM staff. Yeah. To the Briard, to the mm-hmm. VA, to the, you go right down the list. And they're, they're pretty interesting. The Briard has a very small amount of ear removed. The Doberman has a pretty large amount. The uh, Pitbull Terriers, American Bullies, um, Cane Corsos, Preza Canarias, they have a lot of ear removed. Again, they have a pretty large floppy ear when you begin. Mm-hmm. So yes, all of them have a different idea of the shape and the, the length. And every, every human on the planet has a different idea of how they want their dog's ears to look. Because I have people that come in and they'll say, well, I'd like it to look like my old dog that I've had 15 years ago. And you look at the ears and you're like, oh my God, that is really not a good look. But if that's what you want, because you want to recreate your old dog, okay, okay I, I'll, I'll do what you want. So yes, everybody has their own opinion. They are, again, under full anesthesia. Mm-hmm. We put them under anesthetic. We put we do blood work. We but do AKG. Age. Generally, they're like three months, four months. Uh, younger than that, usually seven to nine weeks. Okay, they're pretty young. Okay, so they're under general anesthesia. They have a tube in their trachea. They have IV catheter. They get fluids. They get pain medication. They go home with antibiotics and with creams and with taping so that they don't shake their head and injure their ears and gabapentin so that they have some post-op sedation if they need to. So it's a very um, complicated and lengthy procedure. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get it done and do it correctly. And there are people who say, well, they don't have many nerve endings in their ear. Well, I don't know. I have nerve endings in my ear. I'm pretty sure they still feel it. I used to drag my brother around by his ear. I promise (laughs) there's nerve endings there. (laughs) Oh, you are a lovely sister. I was a horrible. I was a horrible <laughs> sister. I did. I drag him around by his ear. And then he grew up and he got really big and strong. And I came home for his high school graduation. And in some sort of payback, he like picked me up over his head and flung me in a circle about three inches from the ceiling fan. <laughs> That'll teach you. Yeah, pretty much. I, I'm like, okay, peace out. <laughs> you. The nerve endings in the ears. There are. There are nerve endings in the ears. So I think we have to be really honest with ourselves that it's about appearance. It's about breed type. It's primarily a cosmetic pre- procedure. And we have to be honest about it. But mm-hmm. you have to decide what you're breeding for. Because again, ear set and ear leather has changed because people don't really pay attention to it. They don't worry about it because they're going to take the ears off. And as soon as you stop doing them, it's just like tails. You have to be really careful what you're breeding because you're not necessarily going to get what you thought you had in previous generations when you take that procedure away. So super important. And I know this is a dog show, but I do want to at least briefly go into cats. That's right. Quick, let's do declaw. Absolutely. Because all of our dog owners have cats too. So let's talk uh, declaws. Yes. And there are communities and states that have outlawed declawing. And I will tell you again, we have forgotten sometimes that the importance of doing a declaw is keeping a cat, just like a debark, 
in its happy home. If we have clients that are on anticoagulants because they've had blood clots or pulmonary emboli, if we have clients that have AFib and they're on anticoagulants, if we have clients on chemotherapy or that are on um, medications for AIDS and other immunosuppressive conditions mm -hmm. or immunosuppressive drugs because of conditions, we have now taken a cat that cannot be declawed and they can't keep this cat anymore because if they get scratched, if they get bitten, if they bleed, if they get an injury, they're not gonna heal well. And I think we have to really put back to the forefront that these cats are great companions for people. Sometimes in their living situation, it's the only pet they can have. They may live in an apartment, they may live in a senior apartment or a condo or somewhere that they can't have a dog. And if we take away that lifeline of a pet, that only part of their community that they can still live with, we have done a huge disservice to humans. Yes. So again, cats are under full anesthesia. We do it with laser so that they have very little post-op pain. We used to bandage the feet. Now when we do them, we have these cats sticking their feet out of the cages and bopping my technicians on the head two hours post-op. Their feet can't hurt if they're doing that because they would be sitting under them. And right. instead they're thrashing the feet around going, hey, get me out of the cage. I want to go home. So, you know, they're not unhappy. Doing that Siamese yowl that we love so. So, you know, we used to do really a lot of declaws when they were either really little babies and they recovered really fast or when they were spayed or neutered. And now, because that's become so taboo, we have people that do not do as many declaws, but there is an alternative procedure called the deep digital flexor tendinotomy where you leave the nail, but you remove the tendon so that they don't have the disfiguring effect of leaving, losing the nail or the pad, but they can't extend their claws. So it's super cool that they can still be on your leather furniture or with your patient that has immunosuppressive medications or whatever, and they just can't use their toes the same way. So they still have the claw, but they can't climb your curtains and they can't scratch you. So it's super cool. And it's a nice alternative, very easy procedure on the cat. So just want to throw that in because yes, I know, just don't want to forget those. Kids. We're going to hit them all tonight. We got we them got all. Everything. Nailed it. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that we have left a stone unturned on. Oh, all my the God. Well, except that, that you don't happen. have to actually spay and neuter your puppy at eight weeks. But that we've covered. Well, yeah. And that's very complicated. But I will tell you that a lot of the procedures that we're telling people not to do are for, far less invasive and far more beneficial for the pet than spaying and neutering. Because why do we spay and neuter our dogs? Because we're too lazy to control their sexual behavior. It's not ding, for their ding, health. Ding, ding. The American public has become complacent and will not teach their dogs to not lift their leg, will not teach them not to mount a female, will not teach them the things that sexual behaviors will that not come naturally. Dog crate dog. while they're in season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those are just okay. the editorial comments of the guest for tonight. Occasional editorial <laughs> comments. We, we don't, on, not only do we not discourage them, we actually applaud them. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Marty. As always, I love talking anything with you and taboos are no different. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.